Hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Michael with Argyle and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you and then I'll turn things over to our esteemed speaker. First, we would like to thank Rubric for their partnership with today's event. They've been a wonderful partner to Argyle and are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. So thank you again to Rubric. We appreciate you joining us today. We welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. And for those of you who are active tweeters, please follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum and be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. I also wanna take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. We work closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, we wanna hear from you. So please submit all questions that come up during today's event into the chat section of the interface. Following the discussion, we've set aside time for our speaker to weigh in on your questions. And now without further delay, I would like to introduce our speaker, Kev Johnson, Technical Marketing Architect with Rubric. We're pleased to have Kev here with us today for the webinar titled, The Next Big Thing in Ransomware Recovery. Kev, thank you so much for being here today. Welcome and over to you. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is really, it's, it's, a, it's a feature that we announced only a couple of weeks ago at our winter release event. So I'm just gonna go a little bit more in depth here uh, about what we're calling rubric cyber recovery. So let's just click through a couple of these slides. Um, so because this is a, it's, it's not a generally available product as yet, it's just been announced, it's coming real soon. Um, we have to have this disclaimer slide because our legal team insists on it. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be super awesome, believe me. So in this session, what we're going to be looking about, looking at is really four key different areas. And then I'm going to show you how it really plugs together because I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a tech nerd and I, I'm, I'm more interested in how stuff plugs together than the problems sometimes that they're solving. Um, but the key questions when we're talking about cyber attacks and, you know, cyber attacks, are they're not going away. I keep reading books and reports and uh, blog posts and all of these things, and the numbers are just racking up and up and up. And it's really getting to the point where organizations really have to just assume breach. Uh, it's the only healthy way to deal with these things. We'll talk about the challenges that you might have in with the tooling that you might be using to deal with some of these kinds of scenarios. Uh, we'll talk about the rubric approach. So this is rubric cyber recovery and some of the benefits of that approach. And then we'll dive in to the, um, the actual, you know, we'll show you how it works. So in terms of the key questions, so when we start talking to our customers about, um, you know, the threat of ransomware attacks, cyber attacks, the first thing that they're really, you know, that they, their C-suite are interested in is, you know, how confident are we that we can get our business back up and running after an attack. Not not even worrying too much about how quickly we can do it, but could we even could we even recover? Many many organisations will find that they're in a position where you know they they actually have to pay the ransom because they don't have uh, they don't have the tooling, they don't have the people, the processes to help them recover uh, from something like that. And in many cases, you know, they might not have cyber insurance. They've got to find a whole bunch of, um, you know, of crypto coin. They've got to make that payment. The next one is when we start talking more about, um, you know, when people start talking about things like disaster recovery, we start seeing things talk like, oh, well, you know, how can we test and validate this? How can we make sure that these things actually work? Because your business changes all the time. So you need to be able to validate that the processes and the tooling that you put in place maybe two or three years ago still do the job for you. And as, I, as, I'll, mention, as I'll talk about a little bit later, cyber attacks are a little bit different from disaster recovery. Um, so kind of tying back in with that first question, how quickly are we able to restore our business? So if we're comfortable that we can recover, but you know, in some situations, if you've got vast amounts of data that you're gonna to need to recover from, um, you know, maybe you have to get some tapes back from somewhere like, uh, you know, off-site storage, all of that kind of stuff. It's all, it's very, very slow. Uh, by the time that you've recovered your business, it might be too late. So these, these are real challenges. And then finally, this is, this is really when, when we kind of think about the disaster recovery approach. 
typically disaster recovery involves, okay, well, we're going to fill our entire business over from site A to site B. And that's how we're going to restore service. And there might be a whole bunch of things that you need to do. You might need to do some re-IP addressing. You know, you might need to move staff. You might need to have cold storage to, um, you know, to host some some workstations that they can work from. There's there's a whole bunch of things. Cyber attacks are a little bit different because typically you don't want to do go through that whole process. That might be an option for you. You know, if that is the only option, that might be what you need to do. But with a cyber attack, if you can identify the, the objects, the servers, the applications, the files that have been affected by ransomware, for example, you can just recover those and you can recover them in place without having to go through that whole process. So with that in mind, um, I just want to kind of draw your attention to, uh, this is the MITRE attack, the cyber attack life cycle. So you'll see we have a whole bunch of different different phases of an attack here. So we start with recon, where an attacker will, you know, they're, they're, they're going to try and figure out where, where the weaknesses might be in your environment. We go through the process of developing some kind of attack, so they're weaponizing. They're going to deliver that, then, then they're going to hit the exploit. The exploit is when they get their foothold within your environment. They then establish command and control. They go on and then execute their, their payload. So that's the point in a ransomware attack where you start to see, for example, you start to see data being encrypted. That's the point that you notice it. The attacker is there, is still there all that time from that point of exploit. And that might have been a couple of days. It could be weeks or even months in some cases. And this might be a challenge when we start thinking about how we recover. So yeah, there we go. We have, we have this dwell time here. <coughs> So when we start talking about traditional disaster recovery, you know, we're, we're talking about that whole, okay, we're going to fa fail over from site A to site B. There's, there's, there's a challenge here in terms of integration and intelligence, in terms of knowing where that safe recovery point is. Um, often what we see happen when, when, when customers are trying to recover from, um, or, you know, when businesses are trying to recover from a ransomware attack is if they don't have visibility, if they don't have any intelligence about when the attack actually took place they're basically just guessing uh, when they hit the you know, when, when that problem first occurred we need to have a better way of doing this rubric gives you um, you know we have tooling like ransomware investigation that can show you when the encryption happened we also that start talking about automation and agility so again i mentioned about traditional disaster recovery it's typically failover from site a to site b a lot of organizations don't actually have that site B available. So they might be looking at, okay, well, can we, can we fail over into the cloud or, you know, th there are various options. Some of them are going to be faster than others. Some of them are going to be more cost effective than others, but there's always going to be business impact there. The other challenge is that with traditional disaster recovery, you have to define those recovery plans up front. There's, with, with a cyber attack, you don't know what's going to be attacked, so you don't know what you're going to need to recover. So chances are you're going to have to do the whole monolith. You know, you, you have to basically deal with the entire business rather than just the uh, just the objects that have been affected. Because of all of these these reasons, testing is typically it's it's manual, it's complex. Um, I was talking to a buddy of mine who works for um, an insurance company, and they were doing a DR test. It took them three days. Um, just to fail over to DR and fail back. And he did not get a lot of sleep in that time. I do feel sorry for, for that chat. But, you know, because of these reasons, the tests are rarely performed in some cases, if ever. And if you don't test something, much like with backups, if you don't test your backups, you don't have a backup. You don't know that you can recover. And the value of a backup is in the recovery, obviously. And then finally, you know, if we, we want to go faster. Businesses always want to go faster. So um, one of the challenges, and I'll, I'll get to this in a moment, is that when a cyber attack occurs, your security operations team are basically, they're going to lock down your environment. They need to identify exactly what's going on um, so that they, can, that they can be comfortable that they can clean it up and they can be comfortable that everything is gone, that not just that initial attack. Um, remember, I mentioned the MITRE attack lifecycle. Um, so what we have there is there may be multiple tactics, techniques, and uh, processes that, that are in use by an attacker. So 
while you will be able to identify the point in time that the encryption happened and possibly the strain of ransomware that's in use, there may be other um, compromises in place within your environment that you're not necessarily aware of. So you could recover the files uh, that have been encrypted, but if the attacker is still present, you know, you've, you've got problems. So we see that the forensics has to happen um, in, in series with the attack. So even if the ops team can identify that clean recovery point, the security team might not necessarily be happy for you to just recover and bring the business back online. And obviously downtime sucks. So I mentioned all of these things um, on the previous slide. So the, the current challenges with cyber recovery, it's complex, it's slow, it's error prone, and it's difficult or impossible in some cases to test without in, impacting on production. I'm seeing lots of comments coming in um, on the questions, so do keep it up. Um, this is all good stuff. So first things that we notice, we have an attack. We don't really find out about this attack until something bad happens. So the, the attacker is within your environment. The first time you know about it is when somebody calls the help desk and says, I can't access my files. There's just a bunch of uh, text files that tell me to send some Bitcoin to, to uh, you know, all, all of this bad stuff. What do we do? So if, if you're lucky, you might have a tool that can identify these things as they're happening, um, much like Rubrik can do with ransomware investigation. But as I mentioned earlier, production is then down until forensics are completed. So the next step is we need to we need to basically build a sandbox. We need we need what we call an isolated recovery environment. So this is an environment that is separate to production, ideally, um, where you can do some testing. So this is where the security team will do. They'll detonate the malware. They will you know they bring all their tooling to the table identify what's going on. So you have to find some compute, you have to build some networks, you need to define some storage. You then need to select a recovery point. As I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges without any kind of intelligence built in is that you're basically just guessing at what that safe recovery point is going to be. Now, you might be lucky, you might get it right first time. Chances are you probably won't. Uh, so you recover uh, that data. Now, again, you might have to get tapes back from off-site storage. Um, you load them into your tape library, you do your recovery into this isolated recovery environment. And at that point, the security operations team can perform their cyber investigation um, using whatever tools they need to use. Now, obviously, every security team works differently, so they can just bring whatever tools they need into this isolated environment. So we do all of this scanning. We'd go, OK, right, great. Is this recovery point that we've selected, is it a clean, safe recovery point that we can bring our business back online with? And as I mentioned, chances are it's not. So you just go around that process again and potentially again and again and again. And all of this time, your business is down. Um, so, yeah, as I said, this process is likely to be executed multiple times before you find that correct recovery point, that clean recovery point. So this is a challenge, but once you get there, happy days. We can now recover that to production. Now that's for one system. Chances are you have multiple sets of applications, multiple different systems in use within your organization. So basically you've got that whole process to do whether that's in parallel or in series. You know, you have to then identify which ones do we need to bring back online first, which ones can wait until a little bit later. But that's, that's the current cyber recovery workflow for a lot of organizations. Oh, there we go. So if you're lucky enough to be a Rubrik customer and you have ransomware investigation and threat hunting available, then this gives you a bunch of advantages. So first of all, Rubrik ransomware investigation um, will now identify the strain of common ransomware attacks. So they can, we, we do, analysis of your backup data on your backup platform so the data is not going to our cloud or anything like that it happens on your on the, on the platform that lives with you um, and we can go okay we've identified some strange behavior here um, where we see that strange behavior we'll then run that through an unsupervised machine learning process and that machine learning process can identify with incredibly high confidence where we see encryption activity 
At the same time, we can analyze the way that that data has been encrypted, and we can see we can we can basically cross-reference that with, um, with with what we know about common ransomware attacks. We can tell you, for example, uh, if you've been hit by Lockbit. So this is cool. We know what ransom rate, ransomware strain we've been hit by now. So the next thing is we take what we know about that ransomware strain and we build a threat hunt. So we go and grab our Yara rules. So that's how we define the indicators of compromise. So you can go to CISA or your anti-malware provider. You, you can get these Yara rules all over the place. Um, whichever, whatever works best for you. You can just throw that at, you load those into um, rubric threat hunting and you can then use that to identify not only the place where that threat was first seen, but you can also identify the point in time when that threat was first seen. So if we think back again to the MITRE attack lifecycle, what we have is ransomware investigation can show us when the encryption happens. So that's a good place to start. We can then work back from there using threat hunting and identify, okay, um, we know this is most likely, you know, it, it might be a specific advanced persistent threat that's, uh, that's, that's it within your environment. Here's what we need to look for. We can work back to the point in time when they first got their, their, their foot in the door, so to speak. And once we've done that, we can just say, okay, great. We know that clean recovery point. Let's recover that into production. No problems. So that's, that's kind of cool. That's, that's what you get already with Rubric um, through ransomware monitoring investigation and threat hunting. Maybe that's not enough though. Um, so as I, as, as I mentioned earlier, what might have happened is the, the vector that an attacker gained a foothold within your environment for uh, using. You know, th there may be multiple different um, attacks in, in use throughout the process. So what we, what we need to do is identify, okay, well, we, we know we know when the ransomware got loaded, not necessarily when it was uh, when it was when the payload was activated, but we need to kind of take a few steps further back, and that's when we need to we need some we, we need that kind of sandbox, the isolated recovery environment that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, the other challenge is you know even even if you've got this capability to say okay we're going to we know that clean recovery point we're confident here. If your production environment is tied up by your security operations team doing forensic investigations for potential other attacks, you can't overwrite what there is there because they need that in order to, you know, in order to satisfy their uh, their requirements. Um, so we have that challenge there as well. So rubric cyber recovery, just a quick check on time. We seem to be doing pretty well. Um, so rubric cyber recovery is a new feature um, that we added that kind of really builds on top of those capabilities that we already have with ransomware monitoring investigation, with threat hunting, with threat containment, with sensitive data discovery, all of these great tools that Rubrik customers have access to. And cyber recovery is something that's going to be coming to market in the not too distant future. So with this, we can take that, take those outputs from ransomware investigation, threat hunting and threat containment. Now, I've not mentioned threat containment other than a, a couple of seconds ago. Um, but threat containment really builds on threat hunting and it allows us to take the outputs from threat hunting and we can identify those malicious uh, snapshots that, that have been discovered in your environment. Uh, we can then quarantine those so that nobody is going to accidentally restore those, those into your environment. But at the same time, there's value in those quarantine snapshots. So if you have a security operations team, you might want to give them access to those snapshots because they're really useful forensic point in time snapshots. Uh, they can use those for investigation. So that's exactly what they can do. So we take the outputs from, um, those, from, from those tools there, we recover those selected snapshots into the isolated recovery environment. S cyber investigation takes place there. Um, we can also do the cleanup in the isolated environment. Now, this is this is going to be you know very very dependent on exactly how you want to do this, um, but we have a number of options here. So if you do that cleanup and your SecOps team say, okay, yeah, we're good. We know that everything is gone from um, what we have in this IRE. Then what we can do is we can just promote that copy into production, overwriting what we have in production. Or we, if if they're happy, if they just kind of like they want to do their investigation just to make sure that it's been cleaned up, um, and then they're going to manually clean up 
great stuff. Just power down that isolated recovery environment. And one of the things I've not really mentioned so far about this, the isolated recovery environment. Um, so how it works is we use a, we use rubric live mount technology. So we can pick any point in time and we can mount um, those virtual machines uh, into your into into your environment. So these could this could be um, you know it could be some some VMware that you're sharing with test dev or even with production. We've got you, you have your segregated networks. And Rubrik provides the storage. So because of this, we don't need to copy all of that data across into a recovery environment. So we can stand these environments up very, very quickly. So the other workflow that we have here is, you know, this, this, this gives us the capability to restore business very, very quickly, but also, uh, you know, we can kind of take that forensic investigation out and execute it in parallel. So we take the outputs from ransomware investigation or threat hunting, you know, wh whichever you're, you're the happiest with, and we can then perform an in-place recovery. So in-place recovery is a capability that we have that allows us to basically, we, we use uh, VMware change block tracking here. So we can identify only the blocks that have changed between what you have in production and the point in time that you want it to be. So we just inject those blocks back into those virtual machines. It's the fastest way to get back up and running. So business is back up and running with a fairly high degree of confidence there. So you, we know that the encryption isn't happening here, or we know that the threat that you've identified through threat hunting isn't present there. So you can now restore business and the security team can at the same time continue their investigation. So they deploy the snapshots into the isolated recovery environment. They then do their investigation they figure out, you know, they detonate the malware, figure out exactly what's going on. They might want to see, you know, which other hosts in the environment were being targeted for, for these things. Um, and then they can determine if they need to do a manual cleanup of the snapshot that was restored. So remember, we, we've restored service, the business is back up and running. But if they determine that there's still a risk of something else, maybe we just need to uh, run some some specific tools against the, the new production snapshots, we can absolutely do that. So it's on the SecOps team to define what that manual cleanup process is. And obviously every attack is different. Um, they then execute the cleanup against the recovered snapshots in production. And then we discard the IRE. So we just power it down. It's no longer consuming any CP, any, any compute power, any network. Uh, and the storage, you know, it's just it's just storage that exists on the rubric platform. So we power that down. It's no longer in use. So I'm just going to take a moment there and quickly click through a couple of pages of uh, questions and see what we've got so far. Again, we've got lots of people saying hi. So hi, everyone all over the world as well. So this is all good. And there we go. We've got a couple. How does Rubrik guarantee safeguarded data, backup data from malicious and correct? Right. Okay. Cool. I will handle those questions. Um, I, I will handle those questions towards the end of the session rather than try and deal with it here. Um, but if you have got any questions, please do drop them in as we go through. So, in terms of the benefits of cyber recovery, so as I mentioned, we have a whole bunch of different options in terms of. Uh, in, in terms of how we, we can enable you to recover faster and with more confidence from a cyber attack. Um, something else to bear in mind is, you know, these, these isolated environments, they don't have to just be used for cyber recovery. You can use them for testing patches and upgrades, anything where you need something that you can spin up quickly, do something that you need to do, um, you know, without impacting on production because they're isolated. And then you just, you know, power them down at the end of the day. So it's, it's, it, it, the possibilities are literally endless. Um, yeah, so the first thing really is in terms of benefits, it, it allows you to test whether your cyber recovery plans work. And as I mentioned earlier, um, t I've, I've, I've done a fair amount of consultancy in my life. And in terms of testing disaster recovery, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you're stuck on a, if you're stuck on a bridge call for three days, that's no fun for anybody. Um, it maybe makes you think, OK, maybe we're not going to do this. Maybe we'll just do it once a year instead of every every quarter. Uh, with this, you can test your, test your recovery plans whenever you like. You can run, um, cy you know, you can run cyber drills. You can involve the ops, the IT ops team, the SecOps team. Um, make sure that everybody knows 
in the event of something like this happening, here's what we need to do to proceed. Because a well-oiled machine, you know, the well, well drilled machine, well-oiled machine, you, if, if everybody knows what they're doing, there's less chance of panic, there's less chance of something going wrong. We can perform those security assessments easily because we're just using live mount to power things up um, super quickly in your environment. And we can move those forensic investigations in parallel to recovery so we can help you restore business faster. There we go. And my keyboard stopped working, so let's try the mouse. There we go. So one of the other questions that we got asked a lot as we were going through, um, you know, we, we, we obviously build products based on feedback from customers. And one of the things that customers are super, super hot on uh, was the capability to, uh, you know, monitor these things as they're going through. So you're not just kind of like hitting a button and waiting, but also having something actionable at the end. So you can prove to um, your compliance team, you can prove to your cyber insurance provider that actually, yes, we have tested these processes once a month, once a week, however often you want to do it. You know, the more often that you do it, the better the outcomes are likely to be when bad stuff happens. Uh, but, you know, we generate these reports so you can prove exactly what's happened. We can see, you know, maybe you've made some improvements in the process so that systems are restored quicker. So you can show, you know, in, in this case, it took an hour and eight minutes to, uh, to, to run, to restore these 11 virtual machines um, in, five, in, in different priority groups using live mount. We have all of those things. We can do cyber cyber recovery, um, cyber assessments more easily. So my experience with security teams is every one of them is different. Everyone has, has their own preferred tooling. We're not tying you in to anything specific. We're not, you know, th th there is no, well, you must you must use um, you must use Tenable Nessus or whatever tooling you want want to use. You just bring it in, connect it to the same network, um, away you go. You can do whatever you need to do. This is all done in an isolated environment. And finally, so this is this is kind of the very beginning of the wizard for how, how, these, how this process works. So the very first thing we need to do is to determine, are we gonna perform an isolated recovery or are we gonna perform an in-place recovery? So isolated recovery, that's when we're gonna stand up this isolated recovery environment, which we can do whatever we need to do in. In-place recovery is, okay, we're just gonna use this because we need to restore service as quickly as possible. So I'm just gonna take a quick mouthful of tea. And then we move on to the how it works. So, this is basically what it looks like when you kick it off. So we can see in here from our orchestrated application recovery, um, we can see these are all of the different objects that Rubrik is protecting. Um, obviously we have a whole bunch of different things. We've got different clusters in play. We've got um, you know different data centers in play and different SLA domains as well. So you don't need to define any of these uh, things up front. So we can just go, okay, well, we're going to select three objects or a hundred objects, whatever you need to select. Um, you can define this at the t at runtime rather than having to define it all up front. We then go up there, we click on start cyber recovery. And this then brings us in here. So we can see um, in here, what we've got is the, the this is the output of um, a ransomware investigation. So we can see, uh, for example, let me just grab my mouse. Over here, we've got a whole bunch of different suspicious files. So we know that there's a really good chance that we have ransomware attacking these, these particular objects. So in that case, we just go through here, we select the objects that are, that are affected, and we go start cyber recovery. So have, just having that visibility into where the encryption activity, et cetera, has happened is, is super, super helpful. Um, so here we can see we have um, three objects that we've selected. So we've got three different web servers. Um, we've done a threat hunt. So in this case, we've identified uh, that this is these have been hit by Lockbit 2. And so we need to figure out what, where we're going to go from here. So uh, we're going to perform an isolated recovery because, again, we're not going to do the in-place recovery. We need to figure out a little bit more about how that Lockbit, how that Lockbit attack happened and make sure that nothing else has been affected as well. We then need to select the point in time that we're interested in. So we can select any any, any backup point that Rubrik has on the platform. 
Um, but because we have these uh, these integrations with ransomware investigation, with threat hunting and with threat containment, we can see, for example, here that we can select um, only if, if we were doing an in-place recovery, we might say, OK, we want to select the ones that have no, ma no matches from the selected threat hunt. Um, or we might want to select if it's if we we want the bad stuff so that security operations team can do their investigations. We're probably going to be looking at something that's either got one or more matches in the selected threat hunt or that has been quarantined. Uh, once we've done that, we just need to define our compute. So in this case, we're going to select a vCenter server. We're going to select a data center. We're going to select a cluster that we're going to do this recovery to. Now, again, this might be dedicated hardware that you've got specifically for cyber recovery. It could be your production environment. It could be a test dev environment. Because the isolated recovery environment is only consuming that compute, only consuming that network while it's up and running, uh, you don't need to dedicate hardware to it necessarily. It's going to depend on security policies and everything in your environment. Once we've defined the cluster, we now need to select the relevant isolated networks. So these are predefined in vCenter server and um, because these are your networks, it's down to you as the customer to ensure that they're isolated off. So whether you know you have firewalls between them or whether you have def def dedicated separate switching, whatever makes the most sense. Um, but again, we just we just select the relevant networks for um, each object that's been selected, and away we go. The next next part of the process is we need to define a recovery order. So this can be useful if you have. Um, multi-tier applications. Something else to bear in mind here is because this is isolated, you might need to also include some supporting infrastructure. So um, things like DNS, things like authentication, you're probably also going to need those in the isolated recovery environment. In that case, you're going to want those to come up online before you move on to your application servers, your database servers, your web servers, all, all of these things. So having the different priority groups can really help there. Also, we have that capability, as you can see there, that we can add pauses. So if you know you have, um, when you stand up your base infrastructure, um, you're going to want to leave it maybe five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, wh whatever you need, you can add those pauses between those recovery groups, priority groups, rather. And then the next thing um, is the capability to execute post-recovery scripts. So these recovery scripts could do any number of things. Um, it may well be that because this is an isolated environment, you need to configure the environment to uh, to log log data locally rather than sending it across your SIEM tool because your SIEM tool is in production. It's this is isolated, but you still need to be able to access those logs. It may be that you want to um, kick off a scan with your EDR tooling. Um, it could be almost anything. Um, so in the initial release, we're going to be supporting Bash for Linux and PowerShell uh, for Windows machines. These scripts can, th th there's three options here. We can either have them um, already exist on the virtual machine at the point that you back them up. So that might be that might be a use case that works for some things, but you can also inject them as well. So either um, you can provide rubric with a path to that direct path, a path to where the script exists, or we can just hit this edit script button. Um, and this edit script button literally just gives us this pop up. We can paste in our script as we need it. We hit save and at the point of recovery, once once we've got to the point where that virtual machine is recovered, um, we'll inject that post recovery script and we will execute it. And again, there we go. We can see that this is a bash script and this is exactly what you're going to get. Now, we do also have that capability there to if you have post recovery scripts and you want the entire recovery to fail in the event that a post recovery script fails, just check that box there. That will cause your recovery to fail, obviously, in, as if those criteria are met. Um, but it may well be that for security reasons, that's preferable um, to just having it throw an error and warning and, and you can kind of skip, skip on. Once we've done that, we need to give the recovery a name. Um, so it must have a name. Um, it can be anything you like. Uh, by default, if you don't fill this in, it will call it isolated recovery and it will be a time and date stamp. Um, we also have this option to save as a recovery plan. So if you flip that switch across, you can give that recovery plan a name. And this basically allows you to save all of the details that you've selected. 
So the virtual machines that you've selected, the networks, the, uh, the, the cluster, the scripting, all of that stuff is saved. The only thing that's not saved as part of a recovery plan is the point in time that you've selected. So this might be helpful if you have requirements to, uh, for example, to regularly test the recovery of a specific set of servers. Um, or if you have a standard um, cyber recovery plan and you've identified five or 10 of the most important applications and those are the ones you want to test every time. So at that point, you can save that as a recovery plan. Then in the event that you need to re-execute this, you just go and select that recovery plan and you select the points in time and it saves you having, having to go through that wizard, basically. So once we've done, once we've done this, we get this pop-up which says um, the recovery is in progress. So we can come through here, we can monitor the progress and we can see we're at 24% on this uh, particular workflow. And then, it, you know, we go through, we can see it's been successfully tested. And we can then drill into that. We can see every single step in the way. So I can't really see because of the lights in here, but we can see we have each of the different priority groups, the different virtual machines that have been brought back online. We can see we have our post recovery validation. So we've validated that things like VMware tools are running. Uh, we've validated that the scripts have executed successfully. All of this data is there. You can download a report just by going up into the top corner there. We can click across the details. We'll get a bit more information as well. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the key things that our customers mentioned as we were kind of feeling out exactly what they needed for this specific use case was being able to prove that they'd done these tests. And so we've got some super, super handy uh, tests, super handy reports that will kick out you know, all kinds of information, uh, including when, when you see failures. We see we have a failure here. It's not, a, it's not often you'll see vendors that will say, okay, yeah, we'll show a failure in, uh, in, in a report. But yeah, so sometimes things happen. Maybe you've selected the wrong network and applications didn't start up successfully. But we want to see when those things fail as well as when they succeed. We want to know how long it's taken to recover. We can measure trends, all of this good stuff. So yeah, just to kind of finally wrap up this section, and I think I've I think I've done all right on timing here actually. Um, it, we give you that capability to test, validate, and document the success of your cyber recovery plans. Um, we give you that capability to mount those backup that, the backup data into isolated environments for faster cyber security assessments and testing. And we also allow you to we really enable that capability to move your forensic investigations out of band in parallel to, um, so, so the security team can do what they need while you get on with restoring business. Thank you, Kev, for such an insightful session. Now this concludes today's webinar, and I wanna thank everyone for joining us today for this fantastic virtual event. Thank you to our partner, Rubrik, and enjoy the rest of your day.